started with our wonderful author and guest. She's on this side for me. Um, and if you're on the live stream, I'm pointing at nothing. Uh, Dr. Stephanie Strafsky, I hope I pronounced that right. I'm so sorry. Um, Stephanie, if you wanna go ahead and maybe introduce yourself and a little bit about what you do, um, go ahead and tell us. Sure. Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's a real pleasure. So I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist by training. Um, I'm um, the Associate Dean of Global Health Sciences at the University of California, San Diego, where I am now a distinguished professor um, in the Department of Medicine. And um, I, I'm trained more in AIDS research than anything else, but um, this topic um, really kind of came about because in my personal life, my husband acquired a superbug infection. And so um, our, our lives were turned upside down and still are to some extent um, in, in, in a good way. And so I'll, I'll be happy to, to talk more about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so getting into the book, um, you, you talk in the book a little bit about the process of kind of how it came to be, but I'm really curious about kind of like how that discussion went, like whose idea was it? And was, were there aspects of it that you felt like you had to be maybe less candid about, or you had to, you felt like you wanted to add more detail than maybe editors wanted? Um, it just seems like something that for, it, it's such a traumatic, really a traumatic experience. And so to be so open and candid with so many different aspects of this, I mean, what was that, that discussion and that process like? Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm assuming most people have, have, um, you know, read the book, but if you haven't, I'll just give you a little snapshot. And, uh, as I like to say, spoiler alert, the guy lives in the end, but you'll probably know that because his name is on the cover with mine. My husband is a co-author. Um, so we were traveling in Egypt on holiday. He acquired what looked like it was going to be a food poisoning kind of a bug. And it wasn't, it was that he had a gallstone that lodged in his bile duct and it caused an abscess to form and um, a superbug moved in to that abscess and caused this life-threatening infection that threw the next nine months of our lives um, into a major upheaval. And um, when it looked like he was going to die, I came up with this 100-year-old cure to try to save his life. And um, with my colleagues at UC San Diego, a whole network of global phage researchers, the U.S. Navy and um, other players, um, we were able to get phage therapy to save his life. So, and phage are viruses that have naturally evolved to attack bacteria, and they've been forgotten in the West, but they were um, used um, very early on in the 20th century to treat bacterial infections and still are being used that way in the former Soviet Union and in parts of Eastern Europe. So, um, when Tom was cured with intravenous phage therapy, which was a, ra a rather um, innovative way of delivering it to him, um, it was a real miracle, um, it, it, not just in our family, but I could tell that the medical doctors who were our colleagues at the University of California, San Diego, were, were seeing that this could be a real game changer for the field. So the book came apart around because... Um, um, a two-year-old um, was treated very soon after Tom's cure with phage therapy as a direct result of his case. In fact, um, this was, I believe, in April of 2016. Um, and so when we heard about this, um, Dr. Schooley, who was the um, physician who, who presided over Tom's phage therapy, um, told us that, you know, this protocol that we'd used to save Tom was going to help other people. We both started crying. We both realized that this is bigger than us. And, and, you know, I also was feeling as an infectious disease epidemiologist that I'd been blindsided by the superbug pandemic and that the average person wasn't aware of it. So, um, um, I was putting our story out on Facebook and some people said, you know, you should really write a book. And I thought, wow. And I talked to Tom about it and he said, well, you know, if you do most of the writing, I'll chime in when I can, but this is going to take a lot to, to recover from both physically and psychologically. So, um, so I downloaded all my 52 pages of Facebook entries, more than 3000 pages of his medical records 
um, and then started making notes, but we didn't start writing until he was out of the hospital um, many months later. So it was like September 2016 when, I, when we started writing. And so your, Tom was totally cool with publishing this and letting this story about his near-death experience just go kind of viral, not to be... I put it that way. He, he needed some convincing. I mean, we had our moments where we were thinking, like, do we really want to do this? We'd be putting our lives out there on a plate. But then, you know, he thought about it and he said, you know, total stranger stepped up to save my life. If this is going to be able to help other people, then I have to pay it forward. So we both took that attitude and, um, you know, it's really been quite a journey. Um, Tom's been out of the hospital for over five years now. And yet I do talks like this and he joins me many times, um, at least once a week. Today, I spoke to um, a group of undergraduates at, at the University of Texas at Austin. Next week, I'm talking to a, um, a group of medical historians. Um, so it's just, um, it's getting bigger and bigger when we've even had interest from Hollywood. So um, we'll have to wait and see what that brings, but um, it could be even bigger. And so you mentioned, uh, you know, you call what Tom was infected with a, a super bug. So can you describe the difference between, a, I guess, a regular bug like, and a super bug? Like what makes it so super? <laughs> well... I guess it's it's a super uh, you know human uh, characteristics as opposed to anything. Uh, we we certainly didn't think it was very super, but um, but the term superbug it really is um, you know slang for a bacterium that's acquired resistance to multiple antibiotics. There's no magic number, but it's more than just a few. In Tom's case, his bacterium was um, resistant to 15 different antibiotics right off the top only partially sensitive to three, which I call gorilla cillins in the book because they're only um, used intravenously. They're really heavy duty and they have lots of side effects. So unfortunately, you know, he is like this um, poster child for this post antibiotic era that we are entering where, you know, simple infections that used to be treatable are increasingly becoming untreatable because of our overuse and misuse of antibiotics. So you, so I, I was gonna, that was gonna be my next question. Like, are we already there? Or, I mean, seems well, like we are. Yeah, the former director of the CDC, Robert Redfield um, said, you know, stop talking about it in the future. We're already here. Um, and, and, you know, I really do think that's the case. I mean, certainly I'm um, in a unique position where people have heard about Tom's story and they're calling from all over the world like Australia, Mexico, Canada, uh, Pakistan, Egypt, um, Ukraine. I mean, it's really, this is a global phenomenon. I really want to uh, assure people it's not just a problem over there in other countries. Um, it really like um, people that enter hospitals, 15% of, of hospital inpatients acquire a superbug infection while they're, they're there. Um, like most people have heard of MRSA um, or C. diff. Those are two of uh, common ones. But with the COVID pandemic, we've started to see that some of the more, what used to be rarer infections, like the superbug that Tom had, Acinetobacter bomanii, those are, are commonly um, acquired as secondary bacterial infections that follow um, viral infections like COVID. So there's been two or three outbreaks of A. bomanii associated with COVID. So imagine how horrible COVID is. You survive from that, but you die from a superbug. I mean, we're, we're at that point right now and that the superbug crisis is worsening because of COVID. I mean, I had no idea that it was that largely prevalent. So, I mean, if there are multiple outbreaks happening with COVID um, as these acquired like secondary infections, um, I, do you think phage therapy is maybe the only way forward or do you think there's a need for, for multiple avenues? We need a multi-pronged approach. In fact, um, the experts in antimicrobial resistance um, take a macro view and they say that we should be um, using a one health approach to the antibiotic resistance crisis. So what do I mean by that? Well, one the concept of one health recognizes that the interface between animals 
humans and the environment, that triad is, is really the cornerstone to, to beating antimicrobial resistance because um, over 70% of antibiotics used in the US and in several other countries are actually not used in medicine, they're used in agriculture. They're used to make animals grow fatter faster. And it's because we eat so much meat in our society and, um, and unfortunately, antibiotics have been used as growth promoters, even though in the US and many countries now, they're banned for that use, there's a lot of off-label use and loopholes that allow them to be indirectly used as growth promoters anyway. So we really obviously need to be curbing the use of medically important antibiotics in, in agriculture and aquaculture, so fish farming and shrimp farming, um, there's a lot of antibiotics used there too. And so um, we, we need to, to you know, in, involve veterinarians, for example, and, you know, marine biologists and, and you know, folks that have, um, you know, that kind of expertise, but we also need to be educating policymakers. Um, and um, I've been uh, become more active in that space. There's a couple of acts before Congress now, one is called the Pasteur Act, and that is trying to improve the antimicrobial resistance um, problem by um, having um, push-pull incentives to in, in improve the antibiotic pipeline, but also to consider alternatives to antibiotics like phage therapy. And so it's taken some time for the bias against phage therapy to be lifted, and partly because it was seen as Soviet medicine that um, that's been a, a geopolitical kind of bias that's hung over the field for several decades now. I mentioned to you before we started, my undergraduate degree is in microbiology and immunology. And I was telling you that I actually got into it because I loved the idea of phage therapy. And I thought it was just the coolest thing ever. Cause I was the kid that was reading my mom's nursing textbooks instead of like outside playing games with other kids. And so that's why I was a, you know, 16 year old that was super into explaining what viruses were and phages. Yeah, and well, you know, it's it's really amazing because the younger generation and, you know, I'll put you in that, that group relative to me anyway, is very enthusiastic about phage. I mean, right now it's actually World Phage Week. It has its own hashtag on Twitter. Um, and there's a phage um, clubhouse every Friday run by Sabrina Green and Adriana Carolina Hernandez, who is the Adriana in the book at Texas A&M University, who slept in the laboratory to identify phages to um, match Tom's bacterial isolate. Um, so there's, there's so much happening now. It's very exciting, but the older generation of infectious disease physicians who kind of you know, um, still had that cloud over the, over the field there, they've been the ones who've been more reticent because they were influenced by some of the feeling that um, this is Soviet science and, and, you know, it's bad or they're the enemy or it can't be, they can't be as sophisticated as us. Well, we haven't actually a lot to learn from the Soviets because they're far more advanced and, and have great phage libraries, a lot of clinical experience delivering phage therapy. Yeah, when I told my mom I might have to go to Russia for school if I wanted to study phages, she got uh, real concerned. And now I study bone, so maybe it works. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that actually brings us really nicely into our first uh, turn and talk question. And so, um, I mean, phages are a virus. It, it's a family of virus, correct? Well, it's even more than one family. It's like okay. many, many families. So there's, do you know what a nonillion is? No. This is a new word for me. A nonillion is 10 to the power of 31. That's 10 million trillion trillion. That's the estimated number of phages on the planet. So even though we're used to, if you um, know what, what phages look like, the cover of our book kind of has um, an, a scanning electron micrograph kind of, um, um, you know, depiction of, of one type of phage with those little legs that they look a little bit like alien spiders, but there, there's lots of different kinds of phage. In the book, actually, we have a couple of illustrations in the beginning of a pot of phage, which is more of a short stumpy phage. Um, and um, there are other kinds that, that look a little bit like a, a weapon in Game of Thrones. Um, so they come in all shapes and sizes. That's really interesting. I didn't realize there were that many. 
Um, wow. Um, but so, I mean, with all the conversation we've had, I mean, we're talking about phages and viruses kind of in this positive light because they were beneficial, but I mean, I mean, we're all very familiar with the term virus as a negative. And we think of viruses like the cold and the flu and even COVID um, as being bad. And in this case, um, I, I keep turning to the quote, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right. Um, and it seems like it might have taken some convincing to get people on board with the idea that a virus, which is bad, in this case is good because it's attacking the other bad thing we don't want. Um, and so my question for everybody in our turn and talk, do you think there are other instances where we're missing out on something that could be really beneficial and maybe revolutionary, but because we think of them as bad and we, we put them in this box of, you know, it's negative, it's bad, don't use it. Are we missing out on something that could potentially be awesome um, and beneficial? In the past, in this book club, we've talked about bugs. Uh, and bugs are a great source of protein and could, uh, you know, be really beneficial um, you know, you mentioned uh, agriculture and our dependence on meat, uh, but bugs are gross and icky and we don't want to eat bugs, uh, but it could potentially be really beneficial. And even in the last book club that I hosted, we talked about fungi and how incredibly diverse they are, but we see them as nothing more than mold or things in our yard. Um, and so we're kind of like missing out on something potentially awesome. Um, in your turn and talk groups, I'd like you to think about some other instances where we're missing out on something awesome, but we just think of it as bad. Um, so we'll give you like 10 minutes and we'll come back and um, Stephanie will stick here and uh, chat with our live stream. Great. All right, so I'll see you all in a few minutes. You have gotten an invitation to a room. So what do you want to talk about now? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> I did not realize there were different families or like classes. Oh, of, yeah. Of yeah, they're, they are actually not only the most populous organism on the planet, they're also the oldest. Like bacteria and, and phage have been duking it out for almost 4 billion years. I mean, that's where CRISPR comes from, right? CRISPR is actually part of the bacterial immune system that was invented by bacteria to, to, to fight phage. And then the phage have their anti-CRISPRs. Um, so they, they're dueling it out um, at this micro level. Is that kind of scary though? Like if you're thinking about viruses in a, in a therapeutic sense, what you put in might not be what you get out. Well, it's interesting, you know, as I've been talking to people about phage therapy um, and the use of viruses to, you know, kill bacteria, um, it's interesting because so many people that are anti-vaxxers are interested in phage therapy. They see it as a green alternative to antibiotics. They, they think it's, it's a safer um, alternative. So I've been, I've been surprised by that. Um, I think that it's also because over the last several decades, there, there's been a rebranding of bacteria to understand that there are friendly bacteria in our microbiome that we don't want to use antibiotics willy nilly because it kills the friendly bacteria and allows um, space for bad bacteria like Tom's case to move in and take over and that causes dysbiosis and a disruption of, of our microbiome. So the, the phage are actually the gatekeepers in this setting um, because they you know keep the turnover of bacteria going. They do that not only in our bodies, but in the oceans. They um, apparently um, kill about 40% of, of the bacteria in the ocean every single day that they contribute to that turnover. So it's a really fantastic kind of ecosystem. And so I think we just need to be more educated about phage and their role. And, you know, viruses, uh, even, you know, human viruses have, are actually being studied uh, for a role in therapeutics as well. So the concept of virotherapy, where you're using an altered virus to deliver a cancer vaccine or cancer drug or a vaccine or using phage in that way as a little nano vehicle. Those are our new approaches that are under study and um, it's going to be exciting to see where they lead. Yeah, I, I can, in the skeletal muscle field, um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, muscular dystrophy, but you have yeah. a genetic mutation in the dystrophin gene. And one of the, 
I mean, in, with a, especially with like a genetic condition, one of the only ways, you know, you can truly, you know, cure that disease is by fixing the genetics. And so um, general viral therapies have been under heavy investigation in the muscle field um, for those patients. And apparently that is looking really good, but there's a lot of, even in, in non-phage related, but just viral therapy in general, there's a lot of concern and question. Oh yeah. I mean, because, um, you know, yes, if, if the virus is, um, able to, you know, multiply, then it can mutate and, and it can, you know, uh, um, obtain different genes and spread those, those genes. So, I mean, I think that the safety profile is, is important to look at. Um, certainly phage, um, natural phage have been around for a long time and, we haven't had any adverse uh, reactions of even, you know, administering phage intravenously like we did in Tom's case. Um, so we're overdosing with phage when we probably don't need to give as much because nobody's sure of what the exact dose is. Those kinds of studies need to be done in clinical trials. How would dosing studies work though? Because over time the virus would replicate. So I guess it would just be based on initial dose, not like a continuing dose. Well, we are working with a nano engineer who's worked out a way to radio label the protein in the capsid, which is the outer head of the phage, but that only allows you to follow that cycle, right? As the phage multiply and their baby phage or virions go on to attack new su successive waves of bacteria, that um, label, that radio signal will decay. So she's figuring out a way how to label the progeny phage because then you can kind of see, okay, what's the turnover? Where do those phage go? Some of them reach their targets. Some of them might be phagocytosed by macrophages. Some of them can be filtered out by other um, you know, types of cells that, that are controlled by the liver and the spleen. So we don't really know. Um, and that's some of the really cutting edge research that needs to be done to move the field forward. Yeah, it, it seems, yeah, it just seems like there's so much that needs to be done. Um, so you're talking about genetic, are you talking about genetically modifying the phage? Because it seems like the phages Tom was given were not genetically modified. And now, even just between then and now, we're moving into modification? Yeah, so there, there are three really, actually even four different approaches to phage therapy right now, the way I understand it, because I'm still learning. First is natural phage, like we used on Tom. The second is genetically modified phage. Why do we need to do that? Well, sometimes the phage that we find are not the lytic or virulent phages. They're temperate phages. They're what I call in the book, the sleepy phages that integrate their bacterial, their genetic material into the bacterial cell DNA and hit the snooze button. They can carry antimicrobial resistance genes, toxin genes. Um, so that could be harmful to the host. Um, they also can collude with the bacterial cell to make it resistant to attack from other phages. So, and for many reasons, we don't want to use those temperate phage, but if that's all we can find, sometimes like in the case of Borrelia, which causes Lyme disease or C. diff, temperate phages can seem to be like predominating. So those are cases where we will need to genetically manipulate the genome of these phages to force them to become lytic or to otherwise improve their lifestyle. In fact, the first genetically modified phage cocktail to be successfully used to treat a human bacterial um, infection was reported in, in Nature Medicine in May of uh, 2019. And our team was involved in that case. Um, it was a mycobacterium obsessus infection. It's a cousin to tuberculosis. So it lends hope that maybe we could have phage therapy to, to cure TB someday. Um, then the third kind is synthetic phage. And so it would be using techniques like metagenomics to actually synthesize phage de novo. And then the fourth is one that um, some folks at UCSD uh, in Josh Boren's lab um, are uh, uh, training phages, um, evolutionarily speaking, to, um, to make them behave the way we want. So sometimes you might be able to train a temperate phage to become lytic, for example. Interesting. So like just a gold's gym for viruses. Yeah. <laughs> there, was, there was a really neat article um, called How to Train Your Bacteria Phage in, in Nature Not Too Long Ago. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. I might have to read that. I need to train my bacteria phages. <laughs> 
we have a I'm, normally I would save all the questions for the main group, but this is from Twitch, so they're seeing us live right now. So I'm going to go ahead and ask this. With regards to hospital acquired infections, do you think some of the new sterilization techniques like light fixtures that go into UV when a room is unoccupied help or hurt the superbug problem? Well, I think the jury is still out on some of these. I think obviously we need to have innovative ways to kill um, bacteria in hospital settings. Um, there's even phage preparations that can be used to um, decontaminate surfaces. Um, and I'm familiar with um, a company that has like a, um, a robot that actually zaps um, superbugs in the hospital, which is, is pretty cool. A company called Xenex. Um, I went to school with the, the chief scientific officer. So, um, so there's some really innovative approaches. I think that um, we have to be um, careful that what we're doing doesn't, doesn't create more problems. So for example, hand sanitizers, right? Everybody's been using hand sanitizers because of COVID. Well, and in, sometimes they've been using those over so soap and water. Well, soap and water is always better because it has better killing potential. There's some hand sanitizers that have an ingredient called triclosan um, and that have actually been shown to be bacteria static, where it kind of like doesn't kill the bacteria, kind of just, um, you know, kind of makes it... Um, I guess shocks it, and it may be the better. Bill Sullivan would be actually the better person to talk about this. But um, for it, but if you so, if you're not, if you're leaving some bacteria that are still alive, um, those bacteria that are left are going to be the ones that are resistant because they weren't killed, right? So it's the survival of the fittest kind of thing, and that's how resistance occurs because. Bacteria are mutating all the time, and whichever select, whatever bacteria are selected for, that have um, a, any kind of genetic advantage over the other ones, those are going to be the ones that that live and multiply. So that becomes the predominant, um, you know, strain. Well, and it's, I mean, it's global too. So just, I mean, it's similar with the COVID situation. I mean, I can do my part, but if everyone else doesn't do their part, we're not, we're not helping each other. We're not really making any progress. That's right. And I think that antimicrobial resistance needs to be, um, you know, considered within that global health lens, because we're all interconnected. You know, um, many years ago, there was a fellow who was diagnosed with XDRTB. That's extremely drug resistant tuberculosis. And it means that there's no antibiotics out there that can kill it. And he was told to self-isolate while he was getting married. So he got on a plane and he ended up infecting a lot of other people on that plane and it sent shock waves around the world because TB is the biggest bacterial killer. It kills 2 million people per year. And if XDR TB ends up becoming the predominant strain, then, you know, we've got a big problem. So, you know, we've, we've got to make sure that what we're doing is coordinating our efforts and we have to rely on interagency cooperation like what the UN General Assembly and, and World Health Organization have been trying to move forward rather than having an elitist view like, oh, if there's a vaccine against you know, a, a pathogen, we should save it for ourselves. Well, why do you think that um, we're having these emerging problems in, in you know, these new strains like the Delta variant and others? It's because other parts of the world that don't have access to vaccine that the selective pressure on the virus to mutate is, is causing these new variants to emerge. So we're all in this together. Absolutely. Um, so now we're moving out of our turn and talk uh, breakout rooms. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the main room. We've been having great, I've learned a lot in just the last like 10 minutes. <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but I have learned so much and I've had such a great time already. Um, and I'm excited to hear about what you guys came up with and talked about in your uh, turn and talk groups. Uh, you guys can get really creative. So I'm kind of excited to see what you guys all have. Okay, it looks like we're all back. So does anybody want to talk about, um, talk about what they talked about uh, in their breakout rooms, in your turn and talk group? And you're free to unmute um, or if you just want to put it in chat, also cool. So in our room, we um, started out with leeches and went to maggots. 
<laughs> and then went on to Botox. That's a good one. I can get on board with some Botox. So, but, but what, what's so Botox is seen as bad because it's a bacterial toxin. I mean, literally has the word toxic in it. Seems like not something I want in my forehead. Right. Well, and botulism, you know, even the common people know that botulism is something that is really nasty. Well, and yeah. Botox is used to treat migraines also. I mean, it's, it's, used, it's used medicinally, not just for plastic surgery kind of things. That is my implicit bias. Perspiration, too. Can you repeat that, Amy? It's also used for excessive perspiration. That's right. That was one of the first applications approved for it, I think. So a lot of good coming out of something, arguably seen as really bad. Is there any other examples that anybody talked about? We talked a little bit about, uh, about how there's a past experience bias and how people are reluctant to try something new so they might miss out on things and how particularly a situation like in this book, a desperate times called for them seeking new, new alternatives and so forth. And I think it was Ammon in our group who brought up that now people are another bias there is people have a fear of being sued. You know, if they try something new and it doesn't work. So we may be missing out on things like that as well. Interesting. Stephanie, was that something that came up? Well, yeah, I mean, I had to sign um, a major consent form that was so detailed that I put it in the book. Um, but there was a legal team at UC San Diego and Texas A&M and the Navy that were involved talking to one another um, and, um, you know, to make sure that, um, you know, I wasn't going to come back if Tom died and try to sue anybody. And we, we have this issue come up time to time because we've treated many other patients now. We have a center for innovative phage applications and therapeutics. It's a nonprofit um, based at UC San Diego. And we've treated lots of other patients um, and advised doctors and hospitals in other countries about how to administer phage therapy. There are some doctors still that say, oh, I don't want to get involved in this at all. Um, and um, we, you know, get into a situation where we have to find a new physician because we're not trying to bring people to us. We're trying to disseminate this information globally. So, um, but, you know, I think it, it's, it's, understandable that people would be a risk aversive. Um, but obviously in a case like my family, we knew that Tom was going to die. And in fact, I was told that he was within hours of death the, the day that we started phage therapy. So that's why I signed the consent form for kidney dialysis the day that we started phage therapy and he didn't, he didn't need the kidney dialysis. I, mean, that's I love how you brought out the fact in your book that you had to sign those consents and not just anybody could go in and say, oh, this is compassionate care medicine, you're dying and we can try, we can throw the kitchen sink at them and just do anything. I think that it has to be research directed to be able to be important to use and not just for profit situations. Yeah, no, on, on a similar note, I see that in the chat, someone brought up the, sa the same kind of issue around a, the com a Compassionate Care Act that was passed in Indiana, allowing patients to demand experimental treatments under some circumstances. Um, so, um, and they asked, what are the negatives such as interfering with clinical trials? Well, um, you know, the FDA has always had a compassionate use kind of program called, a, it's an EIND, as I described in the book, an emergency investigative new drug. And they haven't turned us down for a single request like that. So even though they get a bad name, you know, because some people feel like that they're um, a barrier to progressive um, new treatments, um, they understand the, uh, you know, the crisis of antimicrobial resistance that we're facing. So, um, so there is a pathway, not just for phage therapy for compassionate use, but for other treatments. It's just that a lot of people are unaware of it. Um, are there going to be, you know, drawbacks like um, having trouble enrolling patients in clinical trials if you can 
get the, the treatment um, from you know a compassionate use standpoint from the FDA. Well, that's one of the situations that we faced with HIV research. So in the early um, you know kind of decade of the AIDS epidemic, the first drugs were um, still being studied in clinical trials, and AIDS activists said we want access to those drugs, and it was their pioneering efforts that made a, a parallel track mm -hmm. of compassionate use treatments available and it did not hamper the clinical trials. And so um, there are so many patients, I mean, we've had over 1200 re requests for phage therapy at our center since it opened three years ago. And so there's no shortage of patients. We don't think that it's going to hamper clinical trials at all because um, there's unfortunately too many people are you know dying without us being able to reach them. So. So both, both pathways should be, be possible. Is there, you can go ahead. has the risk aversion in our society inhibited, you know, development of new drugs, new pharmaceutical, you know, new procedures and, and things to develop. And that's why, you know, in Eastern Europe where there's less of that risk aversion allows for, you know, and the one I was thinking of that there was a, a treatment out of Russia where people that were having growth problems, they break the bones and spread them and allow them to fill back in to, you know, and is that it, you know, our risk aversion less than the geopolitical consequences or, or perceptions of taking a therapy out of the Eastern Europe well, rightly or wrongly, the U.S. has had the reputation of being more litigation oriented than other countries. I mean, I'm Canadian. I moved here and I, you know, um, people in Canada generally, if, they, if, you know, somebody goes to the hospital and the doctor makes a mistake, nobody really thinks about suing. I mean, it really doesn't even really come up. Um, so um, I think that there is more concern about that here. But then on this, the other hand, I don't want to not just look at it one way. The US has been more on the forefront of experimental treatments and then uh, than other countries. And, um, and, you know, even though there's been shortfalls in NIH funding and, and things like that, um, certainly when you are willing like to undertake an experimental treatment for the first time, you're the first one doing it the onus is on you, everybody's watching you, right? And so, you know, it's, it's understandable. And so it's, it's hospitals, hospital networks and physicians. And in um, Germany, we worked with a patient um, there and the, they don't have a regulatory pathway yet there for phage therapy either. It was the physician and the hospital that had to take the responsibility um, and Luckily, they did um, because the child lived and is a success story. Um, and it involved, you know, three different continents for phage hunting for that case. So we, we're still like a ways from bringing this to scale. And that's why one of my goals now is to build a phage library that would be open source, that is um, going to make it much easier for us to find phage when we have, you know, a strange request come in where, you know, because right now it's kind of like, okay, you know, so-and-so needs phage for a Burkholderia sepatia infection. Okay, I know that the folks in Israel have a really good library for that. I know the folks at Texas A&M have a really good library for that. But, you know, I mean, it's not practical for somebody, you know, to send their bacterial isolate to Israel where they identify the phage and then Israel maybe can't purify it. So they send it to Belgium, but it's like, but that's kind of what's happening now. So there has to be a better way. There are ways to make this happen, but I do think a private public partnership is gonna be required. And we do have some social entrepreneurs that read the book, got excited and see that there's room at the table for industry to work alongside a, a, you know, a, a nonprofit like ours. So um, stay tuned, we're, we're working on it. You know, I think- That was one of my questions yeah. is, were antibiotics, did the US go down the antibiotic route versus the phage route because there was no. more financial gain in it? No, gosh knows, it's, it's not really how it worked. 
its phages were very hard to make. They're still very hard to make. And you couldn't really mass produce them and, and store them. Uh, totally not. And, and uh, I don't think uh, people realize, I mean, the early antibiotics, I don't think there was a lot of profit made out of those. It was almost like okay. a public service and it was made for the military at first, like at the end of World War II. Um, I, I was thinking just the fact is that uh, phages and viruses are being viruses are being used now for um, gene therapy, where they make like virus-like capsules of the viruses that really only have like the gene you want to get into the person to replace the deficit or uh, help you know stimulate some kind of healing, and that's a very similar technology is making the phages. So those those viruses are. are like adenovirus, typically it's like a cold virus that pretty much almost, almost all of us have experienced and it's not really uh, harmful except to people maybe are immunocompromised, but these aren't even that. They, 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 only, they can't even replicate. They can just go into the cell and that's it and deliver the DNA, but there's no DNA for replication. But the thing is, since we're doing so much gene therapy now, they can use the same technology, the same knowledge and the same type of system to purify phages because that is actually a lot of companies are working on it. And that technology really didn't exist even like 20 years ago. Yeah, the, the, the most expensive and difficult part in <clears throat> therapy uh, you know, is the, the purification part. Um, and so to try to remove endotoxin, for example, and then the characterization of the phages. So um, to be able to sequence the phage and to, to know where the receptors are and which phage go Good to go well with other phages. That part is, um, it's it's not necessarily required, but it's what the FDA requires. Certainly yeah. in the former Soviet Union and in, in Poland, they're using often crude phage lysate to treat patients. Yeah. Um, they're not worried um, about the the safety um, aspect at all because they haven't seen a problem. But the FDA is holding us to a higher bar than that, especially if you're going to be injecting the phage like treating phage intravenously yeah. well i mean think of what what stephanie said endotoxin that that's the stuff on like e coli bacteria that makes you sick or gives you fever and if you're growing these phages in the think about it you're growing the phages in a dangerous bacteria how do you purify that dangerous bacteria from the phages and you can't give people parts of the dangerous bacteria with the phages because they could die just from the, all that stuff that comes with the we yeah but bacteria. we came across that issue with tom and we consulted with an endotoxin expert from the university of, of colorado um who said look you know the bacteria and, and the phage you know are are already you know um yeah oh yeah it's it out. and there's so much yeah. endotoxin within the body anyway that he didn't feel that 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 because we didn't know what the threshold for endotoxin could, could be. We wouldn't know. We still don't know that safety threshold. So, but um, at this point, um, you know, we are trying to to remove as much as possible. Um, but again, in in you know in in Russia, um, they're they just used crude phage lysate and they do a simple mm -hmm. like cesium chloride centrifugation and types of things like that to to remove, you know, um, some, but, but, um, we, we still need, need more research to find out. Okay. What, what would the threshold need to be? I'm curious, could you talk more about, um, this, these phage libraries? Do you, you, you know, you, you mentioned that your group at IPATH is looking at making a library. You think that this is going to have to be a private public partnership, but I mean, it seems like it needs to be bigger than that. If you have groups and Belgium and Russia and Texas and the Navy. And it, it seems like it's so much larger than that. So like, Oh, I'm talking about like, like tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pages and international collaboration to do this. Right. That's what, you, because, but you know, you don't need thousands and thousands of pages for some organisms like staph and pseudomonas likely need a lot less. So it, the, the, the rule of thumb it, for MRSA, for example, is that maybe 20 to 30 phages are, will cover right now about 80% of the circulating um, staph isolates. So that means that maybe you could use a fixed cocktail for staph, maybe even for pseudomonas. But for Acinetobacter bomanii, the phage have to be specific to the isolate, not just the genus and the species. So you probably need hundreds of phages. So that's the part of microbial ecology that we don't understand enough about right now. We need some folks who can do studies around population dynamics to say, okay, 
based on you know what we know, this is how many phages you'll need for this organism. This is how many you'll need for that. And then we, we can go and source those phages. A program like the Sea Phages program, it's an undergraduate program that trains students how to isolate phage. They have tens of uh, like 10,000 or more mycobacterium phages. Those are the phages that were used to treat the girl in the UK, um, the first genetically modified phage cocktail. So it is possible to do this relatively cheaply, but the parts that are expensive are the sequencing, the characterization, the bioinformatics, and then um, to have clinical grade phage to treat it like a living antibiotic, we would need GMP facilities. That's the perfect world. And so you don't just need one, you need multiple GMP facilities around the world. So. So stay tuned. We've, we've got our work cut out for us, but um, it's hopeful. So yeah. I have a question. So one of the questions in the back of the book says, bringing it down to more clinical, what steps might you take to avoid major illnesses in a foreign country? For example, I worked on cruise ships for 10 years and everybody in all these places, let's eat these oysters on the street. Let's eat whatever is there. How do we educate the public to keep their immune systems safe from some of these super bugs that are territorial in their area? Well, I mean, some of, it, some of it is common sense. I mean, first of all, you should be really good at washing your hands. That's not too moron. With, with, with COVID, um, you know, we've, we've found that, you know, hand washing and, and wearing masks um, is, is part of our norm these days, right? Um, and, um, you know, using soap and water over hand sanitizers is preferred. Um, and, you know, um, there are folks that I've talked to, some gastroenterologists even, that will take um, like a Pepto-Bismol before they have um, a dubious meal. Um, <laughs> and they, they believe it coats the, the lining of the intestine to deter um, you know, bacteria from, you know, causing an infection. I don't know that, that there's been research done on that, but um, I, I think that the safest things are to, um, you know, to, to, you know, be using soap and water, wear, wear masks, and, um, you know, to um, just do the best you can to, um, you know, realize that you're in an environment that if, if you are going to be eating food, that is prepared um, on the street um, or eating raw shellfish. <laughs> yeah. that, you know, you 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 may not be in a, in a country with a healthcare system that can support your needs. So that I always recommend that people get travel insurance that has medevac. Because <laughs> yeah. given that Tom needed seven ambulances and two Lear jets to get him home. Um, and what was the cost? of your nine month for oh well i mean system. i don't really know right because <laughs> like 38 dollars for travel insurance paid for him to get home right that was like you know uh, things are, are you know that it, i'm sure it was like several million dollars um but then as soon as he got home to the us um our health insurance kicked in so um, we have a health insurance program through the university. So it was like, you know, you pay up to $3,000 and then the rest is on them. So Tom hit $3,000 the first five minutes first of, of 2016. <laughs> and then I kept calling the insurance company since I'm Canadian and I just, you know, I didn't really know enough to know if I was going to be hit with a bill. Um, they said, no, that's it. Like, you know, and so when we brought him home from the hospital, we, um, I paid for a nursing staff to come to the house to care for him. That was on my dime because, um, you know, I, I, I didn't want to send him to a long-term acute care facility. He, he was sent to one actually first and they almost killed him. So um, that I didn't put that in the book, um, but that's a whole other story. But you can tell though that we were very privileged and that's why we decided to tell our story to make it easier for other people to get phage therapy. And, um, you know, for, for people to be aware of that the superbug crisis is here and it, it, you can get a superbug here um, at home or you can get one overseas, but um, we're in an interconnected world right now. And, um, you know, so um, luckily um, I have my husband sitting across from me. He's looking better than ever before. And uh, he um, says, hello. <laughs> And one, and I stumbled on this when we started in all the COVID stuff, 
is that um, George Carlin ran on germs. And <laughs> oh, I, would, I would, you realize, you know, and, and how many bugs that would naturally be in our body don't exist anymore because we over process food. You know, I really believe that the hammer is going to be out suing people making hand sanitizer instead of truck drivers five years from now. Well, you know, one of my colleagues, Rob Knight, um, and um, and and uh, and his colleague uh, Jack um, Gilbert, they wrote a book called "Dirt Is Good," and yeah, it's really to try to kind of you know take this away. Like we don't want to like sanitize everything, right? Some like bacteria is good; it's part of our microbiomes, and they their research shows that diversifying the plant matter that you take into your body was actually really important to keeping your microbiome healthy but just to, to know that there's 30 billion phages that are estimated to move in and out of our bodies every single day like i said those are the gatekeepers we haven't paid attention to them because we couldn't study them we didn't even know how to sequence them but now uh, they, they were considered the viral dark matter now we're learning more about them and we're learning about their importance so um so i i'll leave you on that happy note um that the enemy of my enemy can be my friend, and my husband is living proof. He is full of S H I. Well, that's where we got the phages from. Remember, <laughs> sewage. Yeah, uh, we actually had a similar conversation if you were with us back in August about fungi and how they're one in our part of our microbiome. Didn't know that, uh, and and how you know we haven't had the tools to really use them, and, yes. and so. Like there's a similar story with phages and, 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 maybe and archaea archaea as well yeah yeah i mean so many unexplored areas um and i my next question kind of leads into that and i i know you said you might have to leave at 7 30 so feel free to like just interrupt me or like yeah just there's there's one more question um from the live stream that about i mentioned privilege in the book with a push for uh, equity in healthcare, do you know of any phage therapy specific programs to help underserved groups get access to, to phage therapy? And if someone had a friend or family member with one of these superbugs, how do they get the process? So first of all, our center, IPATH, accepts like referrals from anywhere, any person. We ask that, that we work with the patient's doctor so that we understand what their medical history is, that we get an antibiogram, which is an antibiotic susceptibility profile so that we can determine whether or not there's really out of antibiotic options. And then we advise on how to do this. And so we work with the physician. We will work with our partners around the world to source phage. We send the phage to them and we advise on how to administer it. So, and, and it's free, right? Because it's experimental right now. Um, some groups do ask that like the shipping costs um, be covered or if people want to make a donation, that's fine. But until this becomes more standard of care. You can't charge for experimental treatments. Um, so, um, but there is also, there are uh, other nonprofits. There's a group called Phages for Global Health that is an NGO that um, teaches phage hunting to um, students in, um, in Africa and Asia um, so that they can source phages um, to be used potentially for, for therapy. So, um, and, and the Sea Phages program as another excellent program. It's funded by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, it's based at the University of Pittsburgh and their phages now are, are being used more and more uh, for therapeutic purposes. So, so um, you know, I do think that there's lots of room for um, these kinds of partnerships to, to really make a difference because um, we, we need to uh, consider this. It's an imperative and the antibiotic pipeline is drawing right up. You know, I'm so glad someone asked about health and equity because that was going to be one of one of my questions. It's so inspiring how you were able to advocate for yourself and, and for your loved one in such a, a such a just cha probably chaotic time. I can't imagine the just the day to day was probably chaos. Um, and, and you were such a strong advocate. And but it, it took so many resources and, and your expertise and your knowledge in your your professional career that a majority of us just don't have. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if you think there are ways that science and maybe medicine could be better about empowering patients to advocate as strongly as you did. 
Yeah, I do think that there's a role for that. I mean, you know, obviously upper um, income countries have these concierge like peer navigator type things, but there are models in, um, in lower middle income countries like promotoras or health, health outreach workers. Um, and I learned of a new one over the weekend um, for refugees in the Middle East um, these uh, talmines that are um, more informal ways where um, women who have suffered abuses can get, get together and advise and help one another. So I think that there are in, indigenous, um, you know, sources uh, of that could be used as um, as navigators um, and advocates when it comes to this. But I mean, I had to learn um, a lot about medicine because um, the training that I received uh, as an undergraduate was not um, anything that could equip me for this. So I think that part of my lesson is, is that we all should um, ask questions and, and that med medical doctors need to know that it's okay for patients and their families to ask questions, um, that we need to be educated in the process so that we can understand and we can make decisions. And so um, you know, we've all watched the Marvel movies and Wonder Woman's one of them, but we can be our own Wonder Woman, you know, and I think I learned how to put my big girl pants on and, and to ask those questions when I realized that if I didn't ask the questions and I didn't have an informed like set of pathways to choose from that my husband would have died. So, and what kind of response did you get from the day to day bedside staff in the ICU when you were there for nine months, maxed out on pressors, having every septic reaction, was it, it sounded from your book, it was all peaches and cream. Oh, they no, loved no, to keep I mean, There were, there were some moments. I mean, there were some moments, for example, we were labeled a difficult family at first because we had Tom's daughters were, were in two different locations and they were calling the ICU all the time. And so when I was encouraged to join rounds, um, and to, to have this patient you know, centered care, this family centered rounds um, that allowed me to be um, to learn and to be the spokesperson. So that was a, a way that we we ended up not being a difficult family anymore. We became part of the solution. And I've actually co-authored papers and book chapters on my role in that process that was that I was allowed to be part of. So that was a model that worked. But certainly the healthcare system in the US has a lot of challenges. And the fact that, that different specialties were rotating in every two weeks made it very, very difficult. So that's a whole other story, um, but <laughs> exactly. it's, past, it's past 7.30 and I, I know that I have to get going, but I, I wanna thank all of you for, um, for, for joining me. And um, I've learned something talking to all of you as well. Feel free to email me or follow me on Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter. And um, stay tuned if there's movie news, I'll be uh, shouting it from the rooftops. We will share your movie news on our Twitter and social media. Trust us. We are so, thank you so much for, for you know, spending some time with us and, and giving your, your insight. It's been wonderful to hear from you. Thank you. And I'll just say that if anybody wants a signed copy of the book, we can send it to you any, or anywhere in the U.S., way cheaper than you can get on Amazon. So I can send um, a signed paperback, the illustrated paperback for $15. So it's uh, holiday time. So feel free to reach out if you'd like to do that. Okay. Yeah. Do it before Hollywood gets a hold. And that signature will be worth oh, there, it. Oh, there you go. And if you've read the book and you liked it, we would love a rating or a book review, especially on Amazon or Goodreads. Um, it, it really helps. So thank you very much. And thanks to Bill for the invitation. Take thank care. you so much. Bye-bye. So that, first off, incredible that we got to speak with the author, right? Um, I That was amazing. Um, and if you were like me and you read through this story, I, I, I was telling her before the meeting, my soon-to-be husband was gone on a, a family trip and he could not understand when I read this book, he was gone. And when he came back, he could not understand why I was hysterical. And I was so happy to see him. And I, I was like in tears. I was, I'm so glad you're home and you're safe. And he was like, what? Yeah, of course. What happened? And I was like, I read this book. <laughs> and, um, and I've been talking to him about it ever since. Um, if you would like to stay for one turn and talk, uh, just one more. I know we don't have our author with us, but I think it's something, it's something that I was thinking about throughout the book and a theme that was through 
throughout that she kind of shared throughout the book, we typically think of spirituality and medicine as two not only distinct ideas, but very opposing ideas, right? Like if spiritual healing and medicinal healing, they don't interact, they don't work together, you know, you can't have both. But throughout the book, Stephanie and Tom make it very clear that they rely on both. Obviously, Tom is in the ICU and is having these, you know, very spiritual experiences and these hallucinations. Um, and in even Stephanie, although not, uh, you know, in a coma, was still relying on spiritual healers and, you know, positive energy. And, and that's what got them through. And so um, in, if, you know, breaking out into like a final turn and talk, although we're without the author and our guests, I think it's something that we all could and maybe should talk about uh, if we think spirituality can exist uh, with medicine. Are these mutually exclusive ideas? Like, can you only have medicine and not any spirituality or, you know, is relying on spirituality alone detrimental to the concept of medicine and science? It's something that I've been grappling with and going back and forth with. And I think that's something that maybe would be a, a good discussion topic for you all to go through. Um, and so in your, your breakout rooms, uh, I'd like for you to talk about this idea of spirituality and medicine and if they can coexist. I feel like they can, but it seems kind of opposing to me. So we'll go ahead and break out and maybe in like less than 10 minutes, we'll come back and, and I'm interested in having a discussion with you guys about that. Just for me, I, I'm curious about it too. <laughs> so you can go ahead and click uh, join into your breakout rooms and we'll come back and like, a couple minutes. And live stream, I haven't forgotten about you. We love you, live stream. You guys are great. You're wonderful. And I will talk to you. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard for, for us as researchers to like remember that the ultimate goal is to help patients and that one day our hope is that this helps patients. But in, in the case of Stephanie and Tom, it was very immediate. You worked in the lab, you got your results and you shipped it off to California and it saved someone's life. For 99.99999% of what we do as researchers, that doesn't happen. I, I work in osteoporosis and I work in sarcopenia and in aging dementia. Um, the things I'm working on right now, the therapies I'm testing out, maybe in 20 years, maybe. And so I thought it was interesting when she was talking with these researchers, some of them retired and she was referencing their work and trying to get insights. And they were you know, responding to her just like, well, you know, I lost funding or my career didn't pan out that way. And I wasn't able to maintain, you know, I just, the, the funding agencies didn't think it would pan out. So I kind of got kicked out of the field. Think of how many more people could have been saved by phage therapy if we had invested back when these experts, you know, were in there, were just pumping out data and were in their prime of their lab work. If we had given them the resources to explore this, uh, but because, you know, antibiotics were, uh, they were the, the main priority for, both companies and in research. I mean, that was kind of always been the focus because that's what's profitable. Uh, phages aren't profitable. I, that's hard to make. And, and we're facing the same problem she mentions in the book with biologics and like monoclonal antibody therapy. Um, 
We don't have mechanisms for regulating that. We don't really have mechanisms for regulatory wise to develop um, you know, competing products. It's really difficult. And so, you know, it was kind of seen as like frou-frou, like we don't need it, so why would I invest? And it's just so sad to think that th those were just, you know, one or two stories of researchers not being able to see their, their literally their life's work. Uh, you know, some of them got to see it through and got to use that work and knowledge to save Tom, and some didn't. They were pushed out. And it's just, for me, it, it, it was kind of conflicting because you think, that could be me. And it's not the work I'm doing now, it would be like the end of my career where I would start to maybe see it, see patients. And then there's the question, well, just because the therapy makes it to clinic doesn't mean it's accessible. In most cases, it's not accessible. It is so stinking expensive. And with all the non-competition uh, non rules around patents, um, even if one company was able to make it, uh, a cheaper generic option won't come to market for like, I think it's like five to 10 years. And even then the company that makes the generic is going to get bought out by the parent company. And so then we're back to square one and everything's super expensive and nobody can access it. And that's discouraging as a researcher. Like I don't want to develop something <laughs> that like no one's going to be able to afford and that sucks. And so it's so great for me to see that happen and go, oh, maybe my research will help people. But then you have to think about like, the, the reality of it is it probably won't. And so then that's when I go, the spirituality probably gets you through the tough times and get you like, get you through the, the mental roadblocks because I, I mean, yeah, you're, you're staring down death's door and you've been there for months and, and you're just tired. And at that point, medicine isn't going to help you. And so I, I, it, it was, so, it's so relatable. And that's why I was so emotional when my, when my partner came home and I was like, Oh my, like, it's so relatable. Like, and I, you know, it obviously gets into like bigger issues around healthcare and drug development and, you know, private versus public and what's the way forward on um, like, uh, you know, manu drug manufacturing and, and intervention and uh, innovation. Do we publicize the entire process? And that's been something that's been thrown around a lot uh, in like Medicare for all universal healthcare topics. Do we take, do we charge a group like the NIH or FDA, mostly the NIH, uh, with creating like manufacturing mechanisms so that we can take this innovation and actually use it for public good. Um, Cause it seems like that's not, that's what's not happening. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry I rambled at you, Megan, uh, in the live stream about research and uh, <laughs> the failed healthcare system that is uh, the US. So the, if any of y'all go back and watch the live stream, this last, <laughs> Uh, come back to this timestamp, and it's going to be wild. You're just going to see me <laughs> talking about uh, how awful it is to be a researcher. Um, but I really like how in, in this book, like the researcher, she talks, she mentioned earlier, you know, it was funny that the researcher was like sleeping in lab, waiting for data. And I was telling Megan, I do that, and I'm not working on anything for any patient. <laughs> Although I would hope that one day my research would help patients. It's just it would be like some of the people she talked to in the book who it's their life's work. It's their entire career decades leading to like this one moment to save one patient. Um, and like for me, my research, I'll probably never get that gratification with the, with what I'm working on. And so it's, it, it, it's, it's interesting for me. And, and this book caused a lot of internal reflection with me and my relationship to medicine and research. Um, and then, you know, getting into the turn talk question, thinking about spirituality and thinking about how there were times where they both, Stephanie and Tom, had to rely on their spiritual connection and, and their spirituality. And, and does that negate the benefit of medicine? I don't know. So what are some of the things you guys kind of thought about when you when you think about spirituality and, and medicine and, and belief? Because I, I think it's complicated. I mean, they prayed over the phages, you know, before they were administered, both the, the, you know, spiritual healer and her, they, they felt that, you know, necessary and did it help medically? The salt buffer was probably the same afterwards, uh, you know, the, the sodium content similar, but, um, you know, is that, is that personal and that maybe, the, maybe it's a mental effect where it helps, you know, I don't know. I 
Okay. Just to, um, Unmute yourself. You're muted. You know, what, what, what I was saying is that if, if it made the patients and the family feel better, there's nothing wrong with that. And, uh, and it doesn't really matter. What matters really is if the patient got better or not. Uh, not to tease out whether the, the faith healing helped or not. You'd have to do really complicated studies, but that, that wasn't the case. They're trying to save someone's life. And, and, uh, and you know, there are a lot of times people pray in the hospital and with the doctor and after surgery, there's nothing contradictory at all. Nothing contradictory. Absolutely. Just Wonder like prayer in school. Who doesn't pray before test? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. No, I, it just seems yes. like very contradictory. Oh, yes, sorry. Well, where I start to have trouble is where people take it to the point of saying, you know, well, prayer makes you feel better, so that's a good thing. And but the, the whole idea, particularly around cancer therapy, that if you're not thinking positive thoughts, you're going to make your cancer stay. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you're causing your cancer um, because of your mental attitude. And I mean, that's that's the part that I get really uncomfortable with. Yeah, I didn't realize that was a a common talking point. Or oh, it's a huge thing. A friend of a friend of. of friend of my mother-in-law's had cancer and she um, was doing the whole positive mantras, vegan, you know, Mexican medicine, the whole thing. And it's pretty common among cancer patients. I mean, any, that this idea that if you're not positive, you're making your cancer do better. You're, you're helping your cancer or that you caused the cancer because you led the wrong kind of life or you were too stressful or you were too angry. Yeah, but you know, being positive improves your immune response, but to do it instead of proven medication, that's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. I think they're complementary. Exactly. I think along with, although I know from my own experience, my own mom felt like she wasn't fighting hard enough. She didn't believe hard enough. Mm -hmm. She was dying and she didn't, she wasn't doing a good enough job in her belief system and her beliefs and her fight to, to continue on. So can that be a detractor from it all? Yeah, that's, that's part of what I'm talking about. You're not worthy. You know, if you, if, if God loved you or if you were worthy, you would, your prayer would work. Or you needed 10 more people to pray for you on your prayer chain. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> Not, I think that varies from kind of religious beliefs among different groups. Some groups yeah. don't, don't see it that way and other groups do. I mean, it's again, a lot of variability there. But to feel like you're a failure in mm, your terrible. course terrible. of treatment because you're going down versus going up, that could happen anyway. Yeah, yeah so it seems like they can coexist, but it's when maybe kind of one feels like, like when it becomes a competition and like they're, when, when you approach them as mutually exclusive ideas. So, you know, if you're not spiritual then, and you're not strong in your beliefs that, you know, that explains why your medical condition is getting worse and why, why you're not getting better. That's when spirituality becomes this detractor. And it's, you know, especially when you're relying on, on belief and, and spirit, spirituality, spiritual healing, and negating all medicine. I think that's like the, yeah. you know, the extreme that, yeah. you know, nobody wants, but also, you know, medicine alone, you know, doesn't inherently mean that spirituality can't exist. So it's kind of weird. It's like, if spirituality goes too far, we negate the benefits of medicine, but medicine doesn't really interact and impact that doesn't seem yeah i've never seen a doctor tell someone don't pray or don't be spiritual yeah. or don't do your beliefs unless they're trying to do something harmful like take some mystery concoction that, that could be poisonous That's if a you're facing thing. a spiritual crisis because of a uh, potentially terminal cancer case then you are in need of healing the problem is the potential healers out there come in so many different forms from quackery from uh, religious people saying it's God's will or whatever, or you just have to lap your way through it. Um, it's kind of like running medicine without the FDA, without anybody looking over the shoulder to say, this is 
proven to be effective and this is not. There are no rules about what's effective spiritual healing. Yeah, so I mean, some, I mean, it's spirituality superseding medicine is the problem, not necessarily them existing together it seems to be really the major problem here. And so in the way it's approached in the book seems healthy and seems like it benefited all parties. And, you know, nobody was negatively affected by what happened. And if you read through Tom's interludes, it seems like it may have been what got him through uh, having these, these, you know, extra, these, these, I mean, he calls them hallucinations, but I think they could also be interpreted as like a spiritual, uh, either like some sort of internal awakening or some sort of spiritual otherworldly experience um, that, that ultimately, you know, he credits for, for helping getting him through some of, you know, the worst of his medical condition. Um, and I think it's interesting too, how vivid they are. I don't know if a lot of people come out of comas uh, with such vivid memory of those, those experiences and those hallucinations. Um, but so it, it seems like they can exist. It's just, you shouldn't ever negate uh, or, or uh, reject medical intervention and medical benefit um, because of a spiritual belief. And, and that, that, especially when you're talking about a loved one who's experiencing that and going through that and maybe approaching, they're, they're approaching spirituality and, and spiritual belief in a way that is harmful. That's really tough uh, and it's not fun. And it's, uh, it, you know, what, what can you do? Uh, it, it's, their, it's their disease course. And so you, it's complicated and tough. And that's, that's, you know, something I had gone back and forth with as I kept seeing those, those spiritual healing pieces kind of trickled throughout the book. That was just something I kept coming back to. And I thought a lot about, and so I'm, I'm glad, you know, you all thought about it. And I'm, I'm so sorry that so many of you have personal experience with this. And, and I know I do too. And it, it's not easy and it's definitely difficult. And I think that's part of, for me, what made this book so relatable was that it, it was so easy to, to see some of these pieces, even though I don't think most of us have a loved one who acquired some bacterial infection in Egypt and was flown to Germany and then back to the <laughs> States and then had a nine month. I don't think most of us can relate to that part. And but, you know, he ate, it sounded like everywhere he went, he ate everything that was there. He took every risk that was no demand. <laughs> he ate all this stuff. And he always, he had lots of stomach problems. He ate every kind of raw fish on every street in every town. And I'm sorry to say that, but as, uh, again, as the cruise ship nurse, I used to tell my people, don't drink that water. There are different microbes in there. Don't eat that fish because you're not used in our, in a, out of our compact places in our global village, we're not used to all the bugs out there in the world. We're used to our own neighborhood. And once we move out of that, we're often not equipped for that. And people have the side effects. <laughs> well, I think they actually attribute it to uh, the bacterial infection to something else. But I mean, I think that yeah, it right. seems like he had, had frequent run-ins yeah. with the GI problems. And, and hey, if you're gonna travel international, you might as well eat international. So, I mean, he, he lived a life worth living. Yeah. <laughs> and it's still living it, it's still living it. He was right across from Stephanie the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> we should have seen him though. you know I, I i i did a project up in northern brazil and all of the foreigners that came in ended up with some period of time of you know the brazilian version of montezuma's revenge and most of us you know were really disciplined about drinking bottled water and everything else until we realized that we would get the orange drink in the cafeteria it was reconstituted with local water. You know, and I do remember telling somebody on the airplane flying back, <laughs> don't eat that salad because it was uh, wow. washed with local water. And somehow we were at the ER getting an IV later <laughs> that evening. But I won't mention any names. <laughs> yeah, for, this is being live streamed. Let's be very clear. This will yep. live forever on the internet. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. I had one other, one other comment. She talked about how they transitioned from the problem family in the ICU to being part of the team. Would that have happened if she was a welder, not an epidemiologist? 
That's part of what I thought about too. And, and one of the things that I, I wanted to kind of get at with, with the health equity question, because if you're not, it's, you have to educate yourself. And, and, and that's kind of why I asked if she could think of any resources or things that the, the science community and medical community could do to give, because you shouldn't have to be a medical expert uh, or even a, a high level scientist to be able to learn about these things and, um, and advocate for yourself and your family. Uh, you, you shouldn't have to be an expert to do that. Um, because that that is, in essence, what we're talking about with health inequity. You don't have the same chance at the same therapies, um, you know, whether it's because of cost or because of knowledge. And, and neither of those things should be the case. Um, you know, I mean, she even talks in the book how many thousands of people die a year from these infections. antibiotic resistant infections. And not all of them are going to have the resources and the connections and Doc, she even mentioned that even now, patients who are looking for this, there are doctors not willing uh, to give these therapies. And there's probably a million very valid reasons these doctors are concerned. Um, and, and, you know, local constraints and, and the hospital constraints, time constraints. It, and it, it so, to me, so clearly funnels down to just uh, the way that we approach healthcare is so flawed and wrong. And uh, there's so many problems inherent in how we run uh, medical care. And it, it just makes it so much easier for people who are not educated to not be able to advocate for themselves and ask for what they need, because you don't know what you need. Um, most of us would not hear about a family member in the hospital and go, let me search PubMed and learn more about this. <laughs> if you even know what PubMed is, uh, it's, it's a science uh, repository, uh, basically. It's like an online uh, archive an online library for, for scientific um, for scientific papers. And, and most of us would not go there if you didn't know it existed and didn't know to go there. So I just, I, I, I don't think any of us have like an, a singular answer, but you're right. If you were a welder or a carpenter or an electrician, you would not have known to ask for phage therapy or go through the FDA for, you know, compassionate use. But, but on the other hand, how many doctors know how to go and, and weld by by metallic you know stainless steel pipe that you know that know how to do the preheat and all that stuff so you know our things have gotten so where our knowledge base is so specialized you know and and i'll say that you know some of the some of the guy craftsmen i've worked with are as talented and bright as some of the physicians i've known right but their knowledge base and where they are is not in the same sphere, right? And, and you know, um, I wouldn't have known, I didn't know Pub, PubMed exists because it's a medical database. Yeah, you know, would you? You know, I, I, I could, you know, there's other databases I work with pretty routinely that I'm sure my doctor doesn't know about. For sure. And one, so how do we make it so that doctors have the time and capacity to advocate for, you know, spend the time with patients and advocate for those patients and their best level of care. Um, so that, you know, you as the loved one or you as the patient don't have to do that. Um, and I've, I, I've been there, I've been the patient and because I am, you know, I have a background in science. I'm able to, I've come to doctor's appointments with PubMed articles on my phone and, and showing them that. <laughs> <love it. laughs> well, they hated it, but. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> Because I knew I, I had read the literature because it was something that I was concerned about and I knew what I was looking at and how to talk about it. Um, but you shouldn't have to be PhD level educated. Um, and, and so I think it just gets back to this, like the, the way we incentivize innovation and manufacturing is so flawed and the way we approach, you know, health measures as a whole has just been so flawed. And it's just something that's pointed out so poignantly in this book and something that Stephanie emphasizes throughout Tom's care. Um, and so I, well, how I about, think, when, when you take a look at the routine medical issues that people live with day to day, if, you know, how much resource do you apply to that? That's going to support, you know, millions and millions of people versus the effort that goes, that's going to support wow. five or 10,000 people a year or even a hundred thousand versus yeah. something that supports millions. You know, yeah. You know, and, and, you know, when I look at medicine, what I see is flawed is we're not doing a good enough job with the millions 
and too much effort's going toward the, you know, the tens of thousands. Yeah, well, like I said, the way we approach patient care is, is fundamentally flawed um, and, and medicine should be accessible. And I think that's something that we've talked about on and off with this book club. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think this is something that we're going to dive into maybe next season a little more deeply um, and maybe with some experts who can give us some more insight. Um, so I would hold on to some of those thoughts. Um, and also, uh, you know, something that it's something that I'm all constantly looking into. Um, and so maybe we can all come back uh, to this conversation with a little more uh, some some more nuanced questions, maybe or maybe some just some more uh, some more questions that we can bring uh, to an expert maybe in this area. I'm not going to give any spoilers for, you know, the spring season, but I think this is something <laughs> that we'll come back to. So don't, don't say anything. Uh, so we are, yeah, Megan posted in chat that we're out of time um, and we're so happy, you know, for you guys to come out and chat with the author of this book. And it was incredible. Yeah, how neat was that? Really awesome. That's why I let you guys have free reign on asking her questions because it just, it was such a great discussion. Um, we will be having one more virtual event uh, in November with our other co-host, Gio Patel. Uh, and she, Megan is on top of it and posted the link uh, for, our next, uh, for our next book, Misbehaving, The Making of Behavioral Economics, which is, we're gonna have two experts, which will be exciting. Uh, so we'll get maybe into more, uh, some looking into human behavior and how that drives uh, economics and economic trends, which will be interesting. I think, especially as we approach the holiday season, we're going to be hearing a lot about that. So have your questions ready for holidays. Um, <laughs> great job, Allison. Thank, no, thank you guys for inspiring such great discussions with Stephanie. And I look forward to seeing you all virtually uh, in November, ready for the holidays. <laughs> great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, y'all. So Bye. And bye to our Zoom people, our uh, live stream. We love you, live stream. You guys are great. <laughs>